I believe that God has given me something that will bless your life and bless your spirit. And I want you to open your heart and open your mind and prepare yourself to receive the Word of God as we study the Word of God together. It's not so much about me preaching the Word of God as it is studying the Word of God together that we might begin to understand the Word of God. It's wonderful to, to be excited about God, but it's another, un, another thing altogether to understand His Word and understand what He's able to do. So I want you to grab your Bible, get your notepad or your phone or wherever you put your notes, and go to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter number 15, verse 21 through 29. And I want to talk to you from the subject, faith crosses the line. Faith crosses the line. The thing I want you to get out of this is that faith won't just stay in one place. It won't just sit down and be quiet. It, it won't stay on the right side of the tracks. When you really get faith, it'll, it'll cross the line. It'll, it'll break down some barriers. It'll tear down some walls. It'll ford a stream. It'll swim across a river. It'll climb up a tree. Faith is radical. Faith is not quiet. It's not passive. It's not indifferent. It's not insignificant. It's not laid back. It's, it's so radical. It'll crawl across the floor on his hands and knees and touch the hem of his garment. Faith will cross the line. It'll shout out, even though somebody says, shut up. Faith will always cross the line. Again, the gospel of St. Matthew, chapter number 15, verse 21 through 29. We stand for the reading of the word. If you do that, I appreciate it. It says, then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her, Not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Isn't it amazing what a simple little prayer will do? Three little words, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it's, 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 it's not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. And she said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Jesus departed from thence and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee and went up into the mountain and sat down there. Can you say amen? amen. Go back to that 21st verse for a minute. I want to show you some. Then Jesus went thence and departed. Jesus departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Come on, 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, uh -huh. Faith always crosses the line. Spirit of the living God, I thank you for what you're going to do. Have your way, great God that you are. We believe you for amazing things. We believe you to move in significant ways. We believe you to heal all manner of diseases. Somebody watching me right now is sick. Somebody's sick in their body. Somebody's sick in their mind. Somebody's heart is broken and their heart's sick. Whatever they need from you, I pray, God, that you would be the healing power that they need and touch, heal, and deliver. I thank you for being the God that is more than enough. You're not insufficient. You're all sufficient. You're not incapable, you're all capable. You're omnipresent, omniscient. I thank you right now because you can do all things. And I believe you to do all things tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Tight right on the line, I'm believing God to do all things. 
Yeah, said, I believe in God to do all things. When, when, you, when you take the brakes off of God and when you start saying, I believe in God to do all things, not just some things, not just things I've seen him do before, not just religious things, not just things that I deem appropriate, not just things that I expected, but I'm believing God to do all things, powerful things began to happen. I will not try to present this text as if it were something new or profound or prolific. It is a very common text. If you've been in church very long, you have read this text, you have heard this text, you have experienced this text. And maybe it is because this text illustrates to us the power of a mother's love. That a mother would go out of her way and get on the road and, and, and follow Jesus and move out of the city and move out of the town and search and search until she found him. And that she would go through all the ridicule and all the changes and all the controversy because she loved her daughter that much. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's that that makes it so powerful. Maybe it is because Jesus healed her daughter without going to her house. Maybe it's that Jesus just stopped and gave her a word that beat her back home. That Jesus has the power without laying his hands, without touching, without moving, without going anywhere. Maybe it's that. But tonight we're going to delve into this word and we're going to deal with it and God is going to move in a mighty way. I want to pray for you first. I want to pray for you to open your heart and your mind to receive and to learn. And I pray God in the name of Jesus that, that that he's put in me would fall into you in a supernatural way and that God would do great things in your life and in your spirit. And I pray you'd never be the same again. I have the faith to believe that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's do this thing. You may be seated. I want to talk to you about this powerful text because I believe it is important. Often in the process of engaging in the acclamation of the times and the circumstances through which this text is extrapolated, we have a tendency to step over some things that, that I want to underscore and pay close attention to. The first thing I want you to notice about the scriptures that I've read is that Jesus has gone up through the coast of Tyre and Sudan, because we are in a Western civilization and because we are not in the Middle East, we don't really catch the significance. And even if we lived in the Middle East, you don't hear Tyre and Sudan by that name anymore. And so we kind of read over it as if it were irrelevant. But let's, let's delve into it tonight, because for Jesus to go to Tyre and Sudan, it speaks to the fact that not only did he tell the disciples to go into all the world, but Jesus himself was willing to go. He was willing to go where the amens don't come easy. <laughs> he was willing to go across the line where he knew he would be even more controversial than he was in Israel, in Jerusalem, where he came from. He was controversial amongst religious people, amongst people who expected his return. They prayed for him to come, and when he came, they received him not. He was no stranger to controversy. He was no stranger to rumors. He was so familiar with rumors that he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? They responded, some say that thou art Elias, and some say that thou art Jeremiah, and they went down to a whole list. And he said, who do you say that I am? He stepped right over what some say. And, and, and let me tell you something, if you're going, if you're really going to walk with God, you have to be prepared to step over what some say. You can't stop and go back and respond to everything that somebody says about you or thinks about you or says about you. That's the, whatever you think about me ain't none of my business. <laughs> That's your business to work out. It doesn't have anything to do with me, my life, my prayer life, my anointing, my walk with God, the welfare of my family or the payment of my bills. So you cannot make your goal in life to change the mind of what some say. 
Because some say well, some of, they will say some of everything. In fact, they will not even agree. They will say so many different things about you that there will be controversy amongst your enemies. They will hate you for different reasons without ever having met you, don't even know who you are. They will hate you on credit. And you got to be good with that because you got to know that God loves you. <laughs> If you understand then, my brothers and sisters, that God loves you, then you cease to be so desperate to be loved by other people. Wow. If you understand that God understands you, then you will not be so desperate for other people to understand you. If you understand that God validates you, that, that God has spoke to him and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased in that one statement. The father declared clearly who he was and he had the endorsement of God. And once you have the endorsement of God, you don't spend the rest of your life seeking the endorsement of other people because you know who you are. And a few that walk amongst you will recognize who you are. Not all of them that walk with you get you either. You would think that all of your haters were far off, but some of them are up close. Judas will sit right at the table with you. In fact, out of the 12 people that Jesus picked, 11 of them remained silent as to who he was. Who do you say that I am? The silence of the 11 is deafening. Only one out of 12, not even Matthew who wrote this chapter, not Luke, not James, not John, none of them responded who Jesus really was. Though they had been walking with him for years. Only Peter spoke up and said, thou art the Christ. If you have anybody up under you who gets you, you will bless somebody. If you have anybody who stands beside you who understands who you really are and values what you bring to the table, the, then you are a really blessed man. And not only are you blessed, they are blessed because, write this down, the anointing you respect is the anointing you receive. If you don't respect it, you can't receive it. The anointing you respect is the anointing you receive. When Elisha walked with Elijah, he respected his anointing, he received his anointing. When Timothy walked with Peter, he respected his anointing. He received his anointing. When Ruth walked with Naomi, she respected her anointing. She received her anointing and got drafted into the fire. The anointing you respect is the anointing you receive. If you don't respect wealth, you'll never have it. If you don't expect a crowd, you'll never have it. Everything you spoke against, you spoke to your own detriment. Because until you have a respect, you don't have to have it, but if you have a respect for it, you get in line to receive it. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you. And so Peter understood who Jesus was, and in spite of his weakness and his frailties and his mistakes and his errors, ultimately on the day of Pentecost, he stood up and showed who he was because the anointing you respect is the anointing you receive. And the anointing Peter respected was a global anointing, not just an anointing for the Jews, but a global anointing. And that was the anointing he received. And Jesus said, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, Acts 1 and 8, you shall receive power and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Ju Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. In my text, Jesus is going into one of those uttermost parts of the earth. For you understand, there were no synagogues in Tyre and Sidon. There were, no, there were no feast offerings, a feast of unleavened bread, a feast of weeks in Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon is what we would be familiar with as a Phoenician. They were, they were idolaters. They were, they, they were idol worshipers. They, they, they gave more credence even to the gods of the Greeks, mythological gods, than they did their own. They were important cities of Phoenicia because they were near the port where the ships would sail and the Phoenicians were known historically for their ability to build ships, great ships through which they fished and they hunted and they fought and they were powerful. 
It was characterized by natural coals during the Bronze Age. The cities had artificial harbors, infrastructures after the first millennium BC. They were known to be powerful. In fact, Alexander the Great had a hard time dealing with Tyre and Saddam because they fought him back. They fought him by land and they fought him by sea and they were powerful and they gave credence to their gods. The name Tyre and Saddam gives respect to the idolatry of their gods. One of the gods that they gave credence to was called Europa, which is what Europe is named after an idol god. So they were deeply entrenched in a false ideology regarding who God the Father was or who Jesus Christ was, and yet Jesus came up the coast to go see them. Yeah, because Jesus didn't just hang out with people that were convenient and people that were easy and people that reinforced his ideology. Jesus went to Tyre and Saddam. Now I want to go deeper with this because I want you to understand that Tyre and Sidon were cities that the prophets had cursed. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1, uh, God who at sundry times and in divers manners hath spoken unto us by the prophets, but in this last day hath spoken unto us by his son. So even though that they had rejected the prophets, Jesus goes to knock on the door one more time to give them another chance. If you study the epistles, you will find out that later still Paul goes by Tyre and Sidon trying desperately to give them an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ. It is on this mission that Jesus has embarked, obviously with little results, but sometimes results or not, you've got to do it because it's right. Uh-oh, you didn't hear what I said there. Results or not, you got to do it because it's right. You can't just do things that are fruitful. You have to do things that are right. Whether they receive you or don't receive you, at least you knocked on the door. In fact, the Bible said that later Jesus would send out 70 men and tell them to go into every house and if they speak peace and the peace does not abide, leave swiftly and shake the dust from your feet. At least you stop by. To have an opportunity at God is a valuable thing. It leaves you speechless in the judgment because what God wants to do is to make sure that you have a chance. Now hear me clearly when I tell you that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John 3, 16, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I don't think you heard me. I didn't say God so loved the church. I didn't say that God so loved the Baptists, that God so loved the Pentecostals, that God so loved the church of God in Christ, that God so loved the apostolic. No, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That means Jesus was enough to save the world. We didn't need a second Jesus and a third Jesus. When God sent Jesus, the blood was efficacious enough to save from the north coast to the south coast, from the east coast to the west coast. God so loved the world that who so... Now, when God so loved the world, that's universalism. But then it comes down to specificity when it says that whosoever believeth on him, that's election, shall not perish but have everlasting life. You're not saved just because you're in the world. You're saved because you believe. And yet he offered himself to the world. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. He offered this gospel to the world. There was a lot of rejection in being Jesus, but he kept on walking. Oh, you didn't hear what I said. There was a lot of rejection in being Jesus, but he kept on walking. And if you're going to be like Jesus, we used to say to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. Oh, how I longed to be like him. He was so meek, meek and lowly. He was humble. He was holy. Oh, how I longed to be like him. We sung it, but did we mean it? Because the moment somebody rejected us, we were hurt or we wanted to fight or we wanted to cry. But to be like Jesus is to become acquainted with grief and with sorrow, to get used to doors being slammed in your face, to get used to rejection, to get used to being mocked and scorned, to get used to being ostracized, to get used to be rejected. But he could check it off the block because at least he gave them a chance. Grace will always give you a chance. Like it or not, receive it or not. 
embrace it or not. Grace will stop by and give you a chance. And Jesus is checking off the blocks when he goes by the coast of Tyre and Sidon. So at least they could say, you heard from the prophets, but now in this last day, you have heard from the Son himself. He here validates Hebrews 1 and 1 because God didn't stop at sending the prophets through whom he had spoke in ages past and they had rejected the prophets. But now God sends his son and they have rejected him. I want you to understand that rejection is a part of the Great Commission. That rejection is a part of life. That rejection is a part of service. And I want you to know that when Jesus had left the coast of Tyre and Sidon, it was not, it was not a place uh, of great victory. It was not a, a great harvest there. It was not great miracles and great healings and great deliverance. It was what it was, was great rejection. But he still had to go. Receive me or not, I still got to go. Like me or not, I still have to go. See, the problem with us today, we walk in our feelings so much that if, we, if they don't accept us, we get up and go. What we don't understand, it's not about us, it's about God. And you have to be prepared to be rejected, but at least you checked off the box. Do you hear what I'm saying? The, 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 the archaeological region's research has proven and revealed that the ancient harbors lie beneath the modern urban centers that we have today, that this city doesn't exist as it did in these days. You can't get on a plane and get a plane ticket to Tyre and Sudan because they are, they are beneath the soil. They have to be dug up. They're, 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 they were totally annihilated. That started was Alexander the Great when he began to rip through their walls and tear down their barriers and disrupt their cities. But such is a curse when you reject God and you reject his way, then don't complain when trouble tears down your walls and eats up your crops and destroys your resources because you, for, you forgot the bread of life. You forgot the rock in the wilderness. You forgot the manna that came down from heaven. You walked away from the lily of the valley. You walked away from the bright and morning star. You walked away from the ancient of days. You walked away from the manifold wisdoms of God. All of that was in Jesus. He is the Word walking in flesh. He is God incarnate, God dwelling amongst us. He is Emmanuel. He is God tabernacle with us. He is the great I am. He is the morning star. He is the shadows of the almighty. He is the eagle that covers us with his feathers. He is the banner over us. He is Jehovah Sikano, Rohi, and Manna. He is that and so much more. And now all of a sudden they begin to recognize that they had lost an opportunity because he turned his back and he started walking away. Oh God, don't turn your back on me. I've been foolish sometimes and I've been weak sometimes and I've been wrong sometimes and I've been carnal sometimes, but please Lord, don't turn your back on me. David said it this way, hide not thy face far from me. As long as you're looking at me, I know there's still hope. But when you start walking away, I know that you have, have walked away from me like you told the disciples to shake the dust from your feet and leave swiftly and go away. And so we are meeting Jesus on his way out. <laughs> He's on his way out. He's walking away. And one woman who was in the midst of all of this idolatry and this chaos, she makes the decision to go after Jesus. Now you have to understand, you think the miracle is in the healing of the daughter, but the miracle starts in the fact that this woman had to cross so many lines to come to Jesus. She had to travel such a distance to come to Jesus. The distance was not just geographical distance, it was also theological distance. 
She comes from a polytheistic society that has not even heard of Jehovah. And here this woman comes across all of her theological upbringing. She being a Canaanite woman, having lived in a Phoenician city, she is alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. She is not raised in the traditions of the Hebrews. She is not taught in Judaism. She is not exposed to the Torah. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how she heard about Jesus, but while he was knocking on the door in Tyre and Sidon, she must have got whiff of his glory and a whiff of his grace. The Bible said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And she must have got a little taste of something. A taste of Jesus was stronger than a belly full of her idol gods. A taste of Jesus was stronger than all the traditions that wrapped around her. One taste of Jesus was strong enough to make her leave her sick, deranged daughter at home and travel for miles to a stranger. And she's a Gentile woman and she's a polytheist woman and she is a woman of ill repute as it relates to understanding the sanctity of God and yet she traveled to where he was. Most of the time we see Jesus, he is coming to us. But some of the greatest miracles in the Bible occur when we come to him. Think about the woman at the well. Jesus was not headed in her direction, but she came where he was. And I want to say to you tonight that are watching online and you that are studying with me, come a little closer. That God is not promising that he's always going to knock on your door. That in order to get the kind of breakthrough that you need, you may have to move to get it. You may have to travel to get it. You may have to walk to get it. You may have to be alone to get it. You may have to walk away from trouble to get it. The woman looks a little irresponsible because her daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. And as far as we know, she left her home alone. But she knew if she got to Jesus, it would be worth it. And sometimes you have to look a little irresponsible to get what you have to get from God. But she traveled the distance just to get to Jesus. Oh, I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm talking to somebody that sometimes you got to put some work in it. Sometimes you have to travel to get it. Sometimes you have to go out of your way to get it. Sometimes you have to cross the line to get it. Step over your tradition. Step over what you heard. Step over what you've been taught. Because faith will cross the line. Now don't ask God for faith if you're not going to move. Faith will make a man with a withered hand stretch forth his hand. Faith will make a woman with the issue of blood crawl across the floor. Faith will make a woman who has been with five men and now she's sleeping with somebody drop her water pots and say, come see a man. Faith is radical. It's an action word. It's not a noun. It's a verb. If you got faith, you got to move. If you got religion, you can sit still, but if you got faith, you got to move. Because faith is a verb. It requires action. It requires movement. It requires that you do so. Take up your bed and walk. Give me your two fish and five loaves of bread. Go borrow some vessel. Faith requires that you take action. I wish I was talking to somebody tonight that was radical enough to take action and make up in your mind if I have to go out of my way, I'm going out of my way. If I have to be ridiculed, if I have to be gossiped about, if my neighbors are talking about me because I left my daughter at home, I know what I'm doing because I sense something in this Jesus that I can't let him get away until I I've had a personal experience with him. He brushed by my neighborhood, but I'm not satisfied to get close to him and not have an encounter with him. And I'm going where he is, even though the law says that I shouldn't come near him. So not only did she step over her religion, she stepped over his because according to the Torah, she, she shouldn't have had no dealings with Jesus being a Jew. The Samaritan woman teaches you that. Your people and my people have no dealings. Even, even the Torah said that she was exempt from being a part of the commonwealth of Israel. And when she comes to where Jesus is, he told her. Yeah. I don't have no dealings with you. I don't have no dealings with you. Go on back. See, if you are easily discouraged, you will never get what you want from God. 
Because anybody else would have taken Jesus' word for it and left and said, well, he insulted me, I'm not going. He said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In other words, you are exempt from being eligible to receive what you asked me for. It's not that I'm exempt from being able. <laughs> I'm able, but you're not eligible. <laughs> That's what Jesus was saying. I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then she calls him Lord. She called him Lord. But he hadn't been to her. But the fact that she called him Lord stands up in the face of all the traditions of her background. The fact that she called him Lord meant that she had a revelation that he was more than a good man, <laughs> that he was more than a prophet, that he was Adonai. She called him Lord. And when she said, Lord, that is acknowledging who he is. When she said, help me, that is acknowledging who she is. She has put him in his proper perspective. I know you got the power. <laughs> and I know I got the problem. <laughs> See, some people have trouble admitting that God has the power. And then there's another group of people that have trouble admitting that they have a problem. But this woman was not neither. She was not too arrogant to admit that she needed some help. You have to be humble enough to say, help me. And you have to be discerning enough to call him Lord. She knew who he was and she knew who she was. In front of all of these spectators who didn't even want her around, for the Bible says that the disciples said, she crieth after us, send her away. She never said nothing to them. These minions that surrounded Jesus were just in the way. They were just in the way of what God was about to do. And most of the people that surround the man of God are just in the way. There's so much protocol and routine and ritual. They're just in the way. And little men always like to exercise big power so they can feel important. The reality is they didn't have nothing to do with it. The reality is she didn't walk that far to see them. The reality is even if she did come to see them, they probably couldn't help her. But she says, she crieth after us. Because when you hang around power, it is elusive enough to make you think that it's yours when it's not. It's like, it's like standing beside somebody who can sing can make you think you can sing when you can't. See, she was never crying after them. She was crying after him. Lord, help me. That don't have nothing to do with your disciples, your trustee board, your board of elders, your deacon board. None of that. That has nothing to do with any of them. They were just minions surrounding Jesus, standing in the way of a miracle. Oh, let me stop a minute and pray. Lord, don't let me ever stand in the way of somebody's miracle. Don't let my arrogance stand in the way of your divine purpose. Don't let my need to be acknowledged stand in the way of somebody getting a breakthrough. Somebody's got a sick little girl that needs a breakthrough. And don't let my pride become so puffed up that I can easily send away what I couldn't heal anyway. Wow. <laughs> it's easy to send away what you can't work with no way. Send her away, they said. She crieth after us. But she crossed over top of all of that. Everything they threw at her, she crossed over top of that. I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she crossed over that. What are you willing to cross over to get what you want from the Lord? We live in a world today, or the world in the world, in a world today that people are so easily discouraged that if the miracle is not convenient, they don't come. If the parking is not convenient, they don't come. If somebody sits in their seat at church, they don't come. If they don't like the rules, they don't come. Some of, if they have to wear a mask, they don't come. If they have to stand in line, they don't come. These are the same people who stand in line for hours for a ticket to a football game. 
but won't stand in line 15 minutes to get a healing. This woman had traveled all the way up the coast with her sick daughter at home to see a Jesus who told her no. At first, he answered her not a word. I don't know what's worse, the rejection or the silence. Have you ever had to live with God's silence? When you're in a crisis and the only one who can fix it says nothing. I know you heard me. I used to say something to my children, they act like they were deaf. I'd tell them, I know you heard me. Finally, they say, yes, sir. Uh, they were trying to act like they didn't hear me. You know, you, 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 have you ever gone through a time that it seemed like God didn't hear you? He, he, he does hear you. He said, my ear is not heavy that I cannot hear, and my arm is not short that I cannot say. Just because I didn't say anything doesn't mean that I didn't hear you. The Bible said, the Bible, the Bible said that he answered her not a word, but she, she crossed over that too. She crossed over the period of silence. And I think that's one of the most difficult things to cross over. It may be easier to cross over the rejection than it is to cross over the silence. Because the silence makes me think you don't care. The silence makes me invisible. The silence makes me think that I don't matter. That's why when Jesus was sleeping at the bottom of the ship and the storm arose, it challenged Peter's understanding of Jesus to the degree that he challenged him, carest thou not that we perish? How can you be silent while I suffer? Somebody watching me right now, God has been silent while you suffer. And it's made you wonder, does he even care? She stepped over the silence. The silence is not easy to step over. When we read the Bible, we read about what Jesus did. And if we follow the letters it read, we read about what Jesus said. But there is no place to read about his silence. And what I really need to do is to understand what to do when he says nothing. And this woman, this one, this one nameless woman, I don't know whether her name was Mary or Helen. I don't know whether her name was Shawanda or Shawika. All I know is that she was a relentless, tenacious woman who was willing to endure the silence of God. There are times, my brothers and sisters, that we don't preach about. There are times that we don't talk about. We don't run any revivals on the silence of God. We don't do testimony service on the silence of God. We always talk about when God spoke, but we don't tell people how to make it when God says nothing at all. And the rent is past due. And, and, and you don't have the money to make payroll. And God says nothing at all. And the cancer is growing. And God says nothing at all. And your son has been remanded over to the criminal justice system and God says nothing at all. I wish I had somebody listening at me tonight who was in some real trouble and you knew what it was like to be in trouble and God say nothing at all. Do you have the kind of faith that can withstand the silence of God? See, when Elisha was walking with Elijah, he asked for a double portion of his spirit. He said, in essence, you're not ready for it. But if you see me when I'm taken up, if you endure my silence, if you can wait on me when I'm not doing anything, if you can stand there and serve even though you didn't get what you wanted, if you can obey even when you don't get what you want from me, if you see me when I'm taken up, then you can have a double point. I don't give my spirit to people who can't stand the silence. Uh, yeah. And sometimes, Bible students, God says nothing. Our history books declare that there were 400 years that God said nothing. 
From Malachi to Matthew is 400 years where we have nothing written where God has spoken. Nothing that is canonized in the Holy Writ of Scriptures. And they are called the 400 years of silence. When we read the book of Revelations, the Bible says that heaven was silent for the space of a half hour, warning you that there will be moments that God says nothing at all. When they were getting ready to stone the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, the Bible didn't say that Jesus spoke to them. He, sto he stooped down and started writing in the dirt, and he said nothing at all. When they brought Jesus before Pilate and they questioned him, he said nothing at all. And there will be times that you have to go forward when God says nothing at all. I was driving up to North Dallas the other day, and I don't live up in North Dallas. I get confused sometimes going up, and I was on the right road, but I wasn't sure, and I got mad at my GPS system because it was saying nothing at all. And I had to keep on driving in the silence. I wanted some reassurance. I wanted her to say, you're on the right road. You're, you're, you're getting close to your destination. I wanted her to tell me that I was on the right track, but she said nothing at all. She didn't speak again till it was time to make a turn. Sometimes God doesn't say anything until it's time to make a turn. And you have to keep on walking by faith in the silence of God. I don't know who I'm talking to tonight, but if God ain't saying nothing, keep on driving. If God ain't saying nothing, keep on walking. If God ain't saying nothing, keep on preaching. If God ain't saying nothing, keep on building. If God ain't saying nothing, keep on teaching. If God ain't saying nothing, keep on reaching. If God ain't saying nothing, keep on doing what you were doing before. Because when you get to the turn, he'll tell you, in three more miles, you'll make a right-hand turn. Don't mistake his silence for not caring. In essence, Jesus was trying to tell her, my hands are tied. He says, I tried not to answer you, but you crossed over the line. <laughs> and then I explained to you that I am not come but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but you crossed over the line. What kind of faith is this you got, woman, that you keep crossing over the line? You see, we serve a radical Jesus. And he respects a radical people. And this was a radical woman. She wasn't even a spiritual woman. She wasn't even a holy woman. She wasn't even a godly woman. But by God, she was a radical woman. I know she was radical because she kept stepping over the line. And you must understand that faith will always cross the line. It will cross the line. I know I am not a part of the lost sheep of Israel but I'm going to cross that line. Good, I, 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 know, I know you're not speaking to me, but I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to cross that line. And finally, he broke it down real blunt. Have you ever had people you tried to tell them to go on? As my old folks would say, go on now. You tried to tell them go on, but they won't go away. Finally, he spoke to a real play, and he said, it is not meat, it's not proper for me to give the children's bread to the dogs. My God. He called a desperate mama a dog. It is not meat to give the children's bread. Let me stop a minute and talk about the children's bread. The children's bread takes me all the way back to the wilderness when God sent manna down from heaven. The children's bread reminds me that God will feed me no matter where I'm at. The children's bread reminds me that I might be hungry right now, but God is baking up something that's got my name on it. The children's bread lets me know that just because I'm his child, there's bread for my problem. The children's bread reminds me that what God has for me is for me. 
And Jesus said, it's not that I don't have some bread, but it's reserved. Have you ever gone in a restaurant and you walked up to a table and there was a little sign that said reserved on it? I want to tell somebody that's watching me right now that God has a blessing that's reserved for you. It's got your name on it. It's reserved for you. It's the children's bread. Healing is the children's bread. Deliverance is the children's bread. Power is the children's bread. Favor is the children's bread. Deliverance is the children. Hope is the children. Oh, do you hear what I'm saying? Are you a child of the king? Oh, I love those old songs. I'm a child of the king comes with rights and comes with privileges, comes with bread, comes with bread. Like barbecued ribs at a hole in the wall, it comes with bread. Like hot bologna and a cast iron skillet, it comes with bread. The salvation that we have comes with bread. And Jesus calls it the children's bread. He, did, he said, it is not meat to give the children's bread to the dogs. She didn't say she was hungry. She didn't say she wanted something to eat. But Jesus calls healing bread. Oh my God, do you hear what I'm saying? Jesus calls healing bread. Have some bread. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Give us this day. That's what I'm looking for. Give us this day. Our daily bread. Have some bread. Are you going through something and, and you call it, you need a healing and God calls it bread. You need a financial breakthrough and God calls it bread. You need a word of direction and God calls it bread. Would you have some bread? Have you ever been sitting down at the table and the bread was on the table but it wasn't near you? And you had to say to somebody, pass the bread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. When I see you getting blessed, it makes me want to say, pass the bread. Because I know if he's God enough to give you bread, he's God enough to give me bread. And I'm not going to hate on you because you got some bread because it's on my table too. I just need you to pass the bread. God calls healing the children's bread. That's why you got to be careful who you hang around. Because you can't be hanging around a table full of folk that have no bread. I don't care how rich they are. I don't care how influential they are. Just because they got money don't mean they got bread. You got to surround yourself with people that have what you need because what you need when you need it is bread. What you need when you need it is bread. Whatever it is you've been praying about is bread. And the Lord wanted you to know I got the bread. The question is, are you eligible for the bread? And the law stood up in his face and said, no, this woman is not eligible for the bread. She is coming from the coast of Tyre and Sidon where you have left and turned your back. But she chased you. <laughs> Is there anybody out there prepared to chase God? <laughs> Is there anybody out there prepared to go where he is? To get out of your way and say, I won't let you go till you bless my soul. I don't care if it takes all night. I'm going to stand right here till you do something for me. I'm going to stand right here till you restore my joy. I'm going to stand right here till you restore my peace. 
I'm going to stand right here until you give me my house back. I'm going to stand right here until you give me my daughter back. I'm going to stand right here until I get my business back. I feel a spirit of restoration in this place tonight. I said, I feel a spirit of restoration tonight. Whatever trouble is going on in your house, get ready for it to be restored tonight. Whatever's been on your heart, get ready for God to restore it tonight. Whatever's been on your mind, get ready for God to restore it tonight. I smell bread in the room tonight. My God, somebody pass me some butter because I smell bread in the house tonight. Whatever the devil's been starving you from, starving you from love and starving you from peace and starving you from favor, whatever he's been starving you from, my God's got the bread tonight. My God's got the bread tonight. If you can step over your traditions, over your religion, over your region, over your territory, over his silence, and yes, over his objections. This woman said, yeah, Lord, I'm a dog. She understood that the dog term meant not something that walks on all fours, but without a covenant. I have no covenant with you. You don't have to do this for me. She said, but even the dogs, can eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Look at this woman. She said, I got so much faith in you that I didn't come all of this way to get the bread. I'll settle for a crumb. Because I know whatever is in the crumb is in the bread. If there's milk in the bread, there's milk in the crumb. If there's flour in the bread, there's flour in the crumb. If there's butter in the bread, there's butter in the crumb. If there's healing in the bread, there's healing in the crumb. If there's deliverance in the bread, there's deliverance in the crumb. If there's hope in the bread, there's hope in the crumb. What is in the bread, is in the crumb. Go ahead and give your children the bread. Just let me sit in your lap. The Bible called them lap dogs. Lap dogs would climb up in the laps of their master and just stay there with their mouth open. I wonder, is your mouth open tonight? Lap dogs would lay in the lap of their master with their mouth open, waiting for the crumbs that fell from the master's table. She said, I might be a heathen. I might be a Phoenician. I might be a Canaanite woman. I might have come from an idolatrous background, but I know how to open my mouth. Do you know how to open your mouth? Most people don't know how to open their mouth to receive what God has for them. They know how to shout about it. They know how to talk about it, but they don't know how to open up and receive. She said, I may not know anything else, but I know how to open my mouth. And the next crumb that falls, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> Type it on the line. The next crumb that falls, I got it. Uh, you might not, oh, that's not decent, that's not sanitary, that's not proper. But when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, you don't care about how decent and how proper it is. I don't care if it fell out your mouth, I'm ready for it. I just want a crumb. Yeah, yeah that fell from the master's table. And Jesus says, Oh, woman, great is thy faith. There are only two times in all of the scriptures that Jesus applauded someone for faith. Two times in all of the scriptures that Jesus applauded someone for having great faith. And neither time was it a Jewish believer. It, in both cases, it was somebody that was separated from the commonwealth of Israel. 
Somebody who had never served him or practiced the faith, but they believed God to the point that God had to change his mind. To shut up. Great is our faith. You ain't got nothing else going for you. You're born in the wrong side of the tracks. You're raised up in the wrong family. You've been serving the wrong God. But I cannot deny you got faith that I wish my children had. Great is thy faith, O oh woman. I cannot believe that faith would come from such a strange place. Somebody watching me tonight, your past doesn't look so good. And you've got blotches and bruises and mistakes and perils and pains. And you've done some things. That you're, not a proud, that you're not proud of. And yet in spite of all of those many mistakes, you believe God. <laughs> and sometimes you outbelieve the people who say they believe us. Because the problem with people who say they believe us, they get used to Jesus. <laughs> They get used to Jesus. And whenever you get used to Jesus, you miss what Jesus has for you. You remember when Jesus said, I came in the house and nobody washed my feet, nobody gave me the drink. That was church folk. And a sinner woman came in the door and knelt down and broke the alabaster box and, and dried his feet with her hair. And God rewarded her. And they said if, if he knew who she was, he wouldn't let her touch him. He knew exactly who she was. And he applauded her because she had one thing for she going for. She had the kind of faith that would cross the line. Go with me for just a minute. I'm almost done. Go to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 11, verse 20 through 24 in the New English Translation and follow me as I quickly read this text to you so that you can see clearly what Jesus thought about where she came from. Then Jesus began to criticize openly the cities in which he had done many of his miracles because they did not repent. And the day he's talking about her in the next verse, woe to you, Chorazin, and woe to you, Bethsaida. If the miracles done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and Asher. Now, wait a minute. Hold it. Go, go back to that verse again. See, Chorazin and Bethsaida are all Judaistic cities. And they had all the miracles of Jesus. And Jesus said, woe be unto you, because you were my people, and I did all my miracles for you. I didn't do no miracles in Tyre and Sidon. If I had done in Tyre and Sidon what I had done for you, they would have fallen down in sackcloths and ashes and repented. Woe unto you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. You remember Bethsaida, Bethsaida in the Scriptures. Woe unto you who sit in the house of mercy after all the miracles I did, after I healed the man who sat by the pool for 38 years. If the miracles done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Come on, give me 22. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you and you, Capernaum. Will you be exalted to heaven? No. You will be thrown down to hell. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for the region of Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. There's nothing worse than having been exposed to who he is and yet not take advantage of it. He said, if I would have done for Tyre and Sidon what I did for you, they would have repented a long time ago. But because you got used to me and you didn't think it was a big deal, it will be better to have been Tyre and Sidon than to have been Chorazin and Bethsaida 
woe be unto you. I know you came from Tyre and Sidon, and I know I've rejected your city, and I know what I'm about to do is improper. It is not meat to give the children's bread. What God is getting ready to do for you is break a rule. <laughs> God is getting ready to break a rule. God is getting ready to break a rule. To bless. You don't even deserve it, but God is getting ready to break a rule to bless you. You wasn't even in line to get the blessing, but God is getting ready to break a rule to bless you. He's going to have to cover his eyes and ignore something, but God is going to have to break a rule to bless you. Why? Because you've got the kind of faith that crosses a line. I know you got some faith to be watching me on a Wednesday night. It ain't even Sunday, and there you are glued to the screen, hands in the air, tears in your eyes. And if you're not his child, you're about to be. Because God is about to restore the years that the canker worms, the palmer worms, and the locusts stayed up. He's about to give it back to you. And even if he has to break a rule to do it, even if he has to make somebody jealous to do it, even if he has to go out of his way to do it, even if he has to do it and leave people talking about you, even if he has to bless you and other people doubt it, God is who shot out. God is getting ready to break a rule. God is getting ready to break a rule. God is getting ready to break a rule to bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor your blessing is on the way. Your blessing is on the way. By the time you get back home. <laughs> by the time you go back to work. <laughs> by the time you get in the place where the problem was. I'm going to make a change so fast. I'm not even going to go back. I'm not even going to turn around. I'm not even going to lay hands on you. I'm not even going to make mud out the ground. I'm not even going to spit in your eye. But I declare to you, when you get back home, your daughter that had the devils, every one of those devils are going to be gone. I stand here to rebuke every generational curse that's been on your life and on your sisters and on your children. God told me to tell you the devil is a liar. I break that curse. 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 And all you got to do is... Somebody ought to open your mouth. I feel like preaching now. I better, I better grab myself. I better hold myself. I better get a grip on myself. I better try to stop myself. I better pull my own coattail. I better sit myself down. Cause I feel the power of the Holy Ghost about to fall in this place. Somebody just opened their mouth and a crumb fell in your mouth and a healing fell in your mouth and deliverance fell in your mouth. Take me back to about verse 28. I'm going to show you this. And I'm going to get out of your way. And Jesus answered her and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. In other words, whatever you will, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get whatever you will. Whatever you will is what you're going to get. What you're going to get is what you will. Because you open up your mouth, what you will is about to happen in your life. The power of life and death is in your mouth. You're going to get whatever you say. And the Bible says, and her daughter 
was made whole from that, <laughs> y'all can't handle that word, from that very hour. That means that her daughter didn't get better after she got home. That means that the fever didn't break next week. But while mama was on her way back home, that same hour, everything that was on her daughter had to break loose. And I came to tell you tonight, in this same hour, what is an hour, Bishop? 60 seconds makes up a minute. 60 minutes makes up an hour. Within 60 minutes, God said, I can turn around. What's been a mess for 60 years can turn around in 60 minutes. Type on the line, 60 minutes. This is the hour of your transformation. This is the hour of your deliverance. This is the hour of your breakthrough. Set your watch. This is the hour. Don't worry about it. You ain't even got to be home. Don't worry. And the Bible said she took 60 seconds and made 60 minutes, and in just one hour, her daughter was made better. No, no, no. <laughs> her daughter made progress. Her daughter's fever broke. Her daughter was made whole. Whenever the Bible says whole instead of heal, it's one thing to be healed, it's another thing to be whole. I know a whole lot of folk that are healed, but they're still not whole. But in the next 60 minutes, God said, I'm going to make something whole. You're living in an hour of deliverance. You're living in an hour of breakthrough. You're living in an hour of miracles. You're living in an hour where curses will be broken. You're living in an hour where God's going to turn things all the way around. All he needs is 60 minutes. One hour can turn your life around. Y'all don't believe me. Your mouth ain't open. One text can turn your life around. One phone call can turn your life around. <laughs> One word from God can turn your life around. What hour can take the thing that you have learned how to live with and move it completely out of your way. If you have the faith, the cross. The faith that crosses the line. I'm not going to that church. I will. <laughs> I'm not going in that city. I will. I'm not going to listen to that preacher. I will. Because I got the kind of faith I got the kind of faith, 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 I got the kind of faith that across the line. That's why he let me preach to you. I can't see none of y'all, and it don't bother me. All I can see is a red light, but I'm preaching my head off. Because I got the kind of faith that I know if I preach the word, there's somebody out there. Let me hear from you. 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 I can't see you, but let me hear from you. I can't hear you, let me hear from you. I can't see you, but let me hear from you. 
I don't know what you got on, but let me hear from you. I don't know what your hair looks like, but let me hear from you. I don't know where in the world you are, but let me hear from you. If you need a miracle, let me hear from you. If you need to break a curse, let me hear from you. All I see is the light, but let me hear from you. I got enough faith to stand in an empty room and preach to people I can't see because the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost told me, you're out there. I know you're out there. I know you're out there. I know you're out there. And just as sure as I know you're out there, I know your miracle is in here. Open your mouth and get ready to relax. As I close this Bible class tonight, I'm preaching faith that crosses the line. But I'm asking, is your mouth open? Are you open to what God is about to drop on you? He's just going to drop it on you. Like Ruth gleaning in the fields. And they told him to just drop a handful on purpose. God's getting ready to drop something on you. He, is your mouth open? Is your mouth open? Are you receptive? Are you available? You don't need a loaf. You don't even need a slice. What's big to you is so small to God that all you need is a crumb. And in 60 minutes, she wasn't just healed, she was whole. I believe that right now God is making somebody whole. I believe that right now God is dismissing spirits that have been plaguing you and worrying you and been on your mind and in your house and in your family and in your spirit and pressing you down. I believe they're being dismissed right now in this very self-same hour. I believe that God is making you whole. I want to take a moment and pray for you. Father, right now the anointing is in this place. Find every open mouth <laughs> and drop a crumb in it. Find every receptive heart and place a morsel of bread in it. Find every willing spirit and drop something on them. Not just on the mother. The mother's going to open her mouth, but the daughter's going to get the healing. <laughs> Can the mother eat the bread and the child be made whole because there are generational blessings? And something that you eat is going to change your child. God's going to give you the bread and your daughter's going to be made whole. What a mighty God. Your daughter ain't even there. But if mama opens her mouth, the daughter will be made whole. I want to break generational curses and strongholds. Things that are on your heart and on your mind. I want you to have the kind of faith that will cross the line. And I stand in agreement with you right now. Will you, will you just come into agreement with me right now? As if you were touching my hands, come into agreement right now. As you open your mouth and you open your heart and you stop being stubborn and you stop being set in your ways and open your mouth to what God is about to do in your life and be receptive to it. God's got you in transition and your mouth has been closed and you've been open your mouth. A change is coming. 
a healing is coming. Yes. Ha! Yes. A deliverance is coming. With your eyes closed and your, and your mouth open, hear ye the words of the Lord. I got something to drop on you. That's why you're still here. That's why you survived. I'm going to drop something on you that's going to change everything related to you, connected to you, birthed by you. Maybe it's not a physical daughter. Maybe it's a business. Maybe it's a vision. Maybe it's just something that's been birthed by you, a ministry that's been birthed by you, and the devil's been attacking it. And God says, open your mouth. I'm going to put something in you that's going to fix it. Close your eyes and open your mouth and let God know I'm receptive. I will eat the bread that falls from the master's table. I'm not just going to hear this word and click off and go on back to my old life. I'm opening up to receive this word. And while your mouth is open and your eyes are closed and your heart is praying, many of you use the Wednesday night Bible class and you sow your tithes and you can prepare to do that. But I, I, above and beyond all of that, I want everybody that can to get $60. Everybody that can. If you can't, I'm not talking to you. Everybody that can to get $60. And I want you to, I want you to recognize as you give this gift that one hour can change the rest of your life. Even if you're from Tyre and Sidon. And I'm not going to beg, I'm not going to plead, I'm not going to worry you, I'm not going to bother you. I'm just giving you an opportunity to open your mouth and to sow into this moment. The information is on your screen right now. The opportunity is made available to the world, but the whole world won't take it. But whosoever believeth, that's a minority from a majority, whosoever believeth on that level, so that 60 If you can't sow 60, sow 16. If you can't sow 16, sow 6. The symbolism says, I can't wait a whole year for you to turn this around. I need a right now miracle. I need to see some changes in my life immediately and right away. And I own the fact that I have to participate in my miracle. I can't sit back and do nothing and let you do everything. This woman walked for miles to get to what she needed to get to. I am not absolving myself of human responsibility. I have been perhaps complicit in the problem. If I'm in debt, I ran up the debt. <laughs> Sometimes if I lost a job, it was my mouth that lost the job. I've been complicit, so I've got to be complicit in my healing, in my restoration. If I talk my way into trouble, prodigal son, I can talk my way out of trouble. I'm going back to my father's house. Why? Because I came to myself. And I'm going to turn this thing around. And I'm going to give you a moment while they prepare to sing. And I, I want you to open your heart and open your mind and open your spirit in this moment. And I just want y'all to sing for for just a minute or two and give them a chance to avail yourself of this opportunity. If the Holy Spirit is talking to you, I don't know you, I can't see you. I'm just looking at a red dot. 
but the Holy Ghost is looking right at you. And if the Spirit of God is, is looking at you, this may be the hour that sets on course things that have been out of whack for a long time. This may be the hour that you come to know Jesus. This may be the hour that the yoke is broken over your life. 